Good morning, everybody, and welcome today's, to today's event on the Living Wage, uh, brought to you as part of the ESRC Festival of Social Science and in celebration of Living Wage Week. My name is Ishbel McWar-Herman, and I'm a lecturer and researcher here at the University of Edinburgh Business School. I also lead the Decent Work strand of the EWOP Impact Incubator. I'm so pleased to be chairing this event today, and I'm really pleased to see so many of you here with us. So every November here in the UK, we celebrate the living wage movement during a week long series of events, beginning with the announcement of the new living wage rate. For the past few years, Ro uh, Professor Rosalind Searle and I have been partnering with Living Wage Scotland to find ways to share research on living wages as part of the programme of events here in Scotland. And we're particularly interested in sharing the perspective of psychology to balance out what has typically been a more economic perspective. We've run various different events, and this year we're excited to be able to share with you five research papers that are hot off the press. Living wages are more important now than ever. The past two years, while the world has been struggling to manage COVID-19, have been particularly difficult for workers from marginalised and vulnerable groups, and for those in precarious and informal work. More than ever, we need to bring our psychological science around living wages into the debate to show how challenging being in low-wage work is, and also to show the range of benefits a living wage brings to employees, organisations, families, society. The purpose of today's event is to showcase five research papers which were recently published in the European Journal of Work and Organisational Psychology as a special issue on living wages. The five short talks being presented will show how psychological science is expanding knowledge of the impact and consequences of low paid work on workers, organizations and societies. Following the talks, we'll give a preview of a new game that's currently in development due to be released early next year. The game is a really exciting development in knowledge translation and is designed to be used in teaching and in executive education. It will be used to raise awareness of low paid work and to gain insights into the experiences of living wages for workers and organizations. Uh, next slide please, Roz. So I just wanted to begin with some housekeeping points for you to be aware of. First of all, the session is being recorded and the recording will be posted online following the event so that others are able to watch it later on. Um, secondly, please keep your audio and camera off unless you're speaking. We will have two dedicated um, Q&A sessions scheduled in the program, so we'll respond to questions during those times. We won't have an opportunity for questions after each speaker. Um, next slide, please, Roz. So uh, the program for the event is as follows. Um, we will start with um, Roz giving a talk about uh, where we've been and why work and organizational psychology science matters. Um, We'll then move on to Dr. Andrew Werner from Middlesex University about talking about her research on SMEs. Um, after that, we'll have Katarina Klug and Dr. Eva Selenko speaking about their work around um, economic vulnerability. And at that point, we're going to stop for um, some Q&A on the first three talks. We'll have a quick break then so you can grab a coffee, um, run to the toilet, whatever you need to do, and then we'll come back and have our final two speakers. Uh, which will be um, Dr. Soibert from University of Innsbruck in Austria, talking about living wages, decent work and need satisfaction. Uh, Dr. Mahima Saxena will then speak to us about her work um, on cultural skills as drivers of decency and decent work. And then, as I mentioned, we'll return for our um, preview of our serious game that we're, um, that we're going to show with you today. After that, we'll have another opportunity for questions um, about the final two talks and about the serious game. Um, and that will be us. So without further ado, um, I would like to hand over to uh, Professor Rosalind Searle now. Um, Ros is Professor of Human Resource Management and Organizational Psychology at the University of Glasgow Adam Smith Business School. She's also director of the EWOP Impact Incubator, which aims to translate psychological research into policy outcomes across Europe. It's my great pleasure to welcome Roz to provide an introduction into where we've been and why work psychology matters. Thanks, Roz. Thank you very much, Ishbel, and thank you for the opportunity um, to talk to you and share our journey through this. Uh, and really this presentation is an amalgam of ongoing work by myself 
uh, and Ishbel and also with Stuart Carr. So research on focusing on this topic has really started to come to the fore and particularly uh, the work that we've been doing together has highlighted, particularly over the last five years, that this has started to become more important. So why does it matter really for uh, work psychology? Well, you can see we've got a decent work stream. We've deliberately not called it living wages because we see um, living wages as part of a wider agenda that's all around looking at work. And really, we focus on this because we need to understand that work has this material benefit in terms of both economic, but also um, well-being. Uh, it has a striving for equal opportunities and for um, human development, as the International Labour Organization highlights. It's also a topic that, as Ishbel highlighted, the UN have identified, particularly in their um, goal eight uh, and thinking particularly around uh, 8.5, thinking about equality in terms of men and women. So what do we mean by the living wage? Uh, I was teaching my MBAs yesterday about this and really highlighting that it's different from the minimum wage. It's designed to be a wage level that lifts workers from poverty and results in growing calls that this actually is meeting the cost of living, which particularly uh, in the UK, we're seeing rising inflation, and so this is important for people. So it's focusing beyond that mere survival to allow people to fully participate. So we've been on a, a journey, if you like, since 2018, where we first put in a call for a small group meeting, and that was successful, and we ran that in 2019, and that really has helped us by setting, uh, if you like, our compass to highlight particular points that are important to include along this journey. So we, in 2020, as Ishbel highlighted, partnered with Living Wage Scotland, and we use that to build from the participants from our small group meeting to create these resources, and they're available on our website. So four different briefing packs designed for different audiences. And we also wrote at that time a piece about why living wages is critical as part of post-pandemic recovery efforts. Uh, and again, that's a conversation piece that's available. So following uh, this year, we launched in May our animation and we have put it in a variety of different languages. So this is available in Filipino, in Thai, in uh, both Cantonese and uh, Mandarin. And these has been largely in response to people coming to us to say, we love the animation can you give it to us in our language? So we've been very happy to do that and we will do that on an ongoing basis um, as requests come in. We also, as Ishbel highlighted, um, have created um, this um, special um, issue for um, the European Journal of Work and Organisational Psychology that brings together the speakers that you will be hearing for the rest of this programme. And on Tuesday, we worked um, with Living Wage Scotland, but also Edinburgh City in realising its ambition to become a living wage space. Um, and again, there are things available on the website. There's a short film that's about that. So let me focus in, in my time now on our research and what we showed. So Isabel and I undertook a very um, focused analysis thinking through from 2000 about what were the papers that had talked about a uh, living wage and this is freely available um, on the um, on the website as well and through our analysis we were able to show the striking uptick that's happened in interest in this topic particularly from psychology over the last five year period and this slide really shows how that has happened and particularly people from management, from industrial relations starting to become involved. And that has helped us to shift the focus of interest away from a more employer focus, thinking about the burden that living wages puts on people to start to understand the burden of the job on the employer and the employee, where it may lock them into things and leave people feeling that they are trapped within something and that they have insufficient time and money that is focusing them on not just having one job, but having multiple jobs. So what we've been drawing attention and others within this um, 
will be drawing attention throughout the rest of this webinar to thinking more about that person-centric perspective. So trying to understand that wages are have impacts and consequences for individuals and trying to understand what those elements are and critically push beyond to understand what is decent work. So part of that has been about amplifying employee voices and experiences. And let me share with you some of the quotes that have just come in from a study that Ishpel and I are running, looking at people making that transition to their employer becoming a living wage provider. So people talking about they think the company is doing great and they should be proud of what's happening. So feeling that they are aligned and that they are proud of their organisation making this transition. People again affirming how much they're enjoying their job. But also what we see is that it's highlighting that it's not just about the money that's paid, it's also about living hours. It's also about focusing on that decent work agenda. And again, to highlight, that's why we've called this strand decent work. So we've also um, highlighted the, uh, the need to, to move from surviving to thriving. What does that look like? And then highlighting also the well-being implications, the health implications and the psychological benefits in terms of mental health through that. So it's all about unpacking that psychological dimension for people and to critically to see this as part of that wider decent work agenda. So we can uh, differentiate the psychological dimensions in two specific areas. First of all, thinking about sustainability and then thinking about capability. So from a sustainability perspective, and um, we have this idea that it's income that's coming into a family to allow that family to live. But it's more than that. It's participating in society. And as this shows, it's about being able to allow your child to go to the party because you can buy a present for the other children so that child can participate in society. It's also about being able to have a nest egg that you can draw on in terms of being able to um, sort out the car repair or when the boiler breaks at this time of year. It's about helping people with rest and recovery and that can be just simply um, from their job but it also can be specific things that are coming up um, that, are, that if they were to have multiple jobs would really start to have long-term damage to their bodies. So from that we can see it's about that recuperation but it, that also that recovery is about spending time with people uh, that we love and that can be uh, with our friends as well as with our family. So from that we can also see uh, capabilities as a, a critical area that is amplified where it's the whole workforce that benefits and becomes more productive because basically you're not having to divert attention to cover for other people or to cover for sickness absence. Also through that it allows people the cap capability to achieve their potential to learn and to grow that might be through a degree or it might be through other qualifications and things such as learning to drive. So from that they're able to rebuild and focus on their career and manage that more successfully rather than just being tied and unable to really have choices and freedom. So those psychological dimensions then that we highlight really were through our um, work highlighting new areas to focus on. So we've focus very much on workers and workplaces, but we really need to start expanding that to think about the spillover consequences. So how does that nexus between family um, and worker come into play? Does it actually, we argue that it might lead to better quality family relationships. There's a need to explore that. Also, how does it benefit society? Again, we haven't really examined this um, consequence, this spillover. Then thinking about what do people actually do in terms of their capability? Do we see this uptick in terms of where they're going to? Or do people um, feel that they can't move and shift from their communities in different ways? Again, we need to explore this more. We also need to think about this um, focus on decent work. So it's not just about the money. It needs to be focusing on other things and to understand what are those other dimensions so that we can help identify and work with businesses to understand what they need to be paying attention to. So from an organisation, we know that the employer consequences are very strong in terms of making employers more attractive. And we can see within the Edinburgh perspective, once you become a living um, space, it actually should attract a much bigger pool of talent for your area and for the surrounding businesses within it, not just the business per se. It also makes 
makes employees much more likely to stay within your business. And through that, it improves your retention. So again, that's going to have a saving in terms of not having to spend money either on advertising and or recruitment processes that take your line managers away from that and your HR function. Also, it means that your sickness and absence is likely to be reduced. So again, that has huge consequences and dividends across your whole workforce, because it means that people can do their job rather than their job plus the other bits that somebody else isn't doing. So it has a huge uh, benefit in terms of making um, other workers um, feel more satisfied with their jobs. So really what we're arguing is that you're going to get this change for a business that's going from firefighting on focusing on getting people over your door to replace people that are leaving, to think about your future, to be able to build the capability of your entire workforce and through that striving, take your business to the next level that it needs and wants to go to. So it's really improving the lot for everybody within that. Uh, and allowing people to think about their future, it's giving you that space to and capability to be able to do that. So from that, we're arguing that it was also going to allow people that space to come up with ideas, come up with new suggestions that they can make in terms of how to improve it. But also they're going to care about it. In the event we were running last Tuesday, one of the employers was reflecting and talking about the fact that during the pandemic, hospitality was really badly hit by people just not turning up for work. And he said the di difference for their business was that their staff did turn up because they felt that they wanted to give back to that business and help that business by showing up for work. You know, that was something that they felt respected so they wanted to give that back so again ideas and innovation are likely to be higher plus we're also likely to see quite a substantial um, reduction in terms of counterproductive work behaviors and sabotage theft and waste within the business again that waste might be also waste because people are tired they're distracted and so therefore they make mistakes where you've got living wages, as we've highlighted, people have that opportunity for rest and recovery. So let me leave um, my presentation here. If you would like um, to look at uh, both the paper, but also our second piece, which is the editorial around this striving for more that really adds more and also praises the papers in that and also our uh, conversation piece, then these are all available on our website um, and you'll find the details at the end. So thank you.